All right. Hi, guys. Mike Ferrante with Century 21 Homestar and the 21 Mike team. There's our sign info, so forth, right there. I'm going to change the background right now to something a little more studious. How about that? Like I'm in a library studying. And today we're going to do a one hour elective CE. This is top five listing secrets, how to sell your listings and impress sellers. So essentially our team carries anywhere from 50 to 100 listings. I've been licensed since 2008 and I do have my broker's license, broker associate with Homestar. I'm kind of the backup broker. I don't really want to ever be the broker. So if you guys have ever talked to Tony, uh, hopefully nothing ever happens to Tony because I do not want to fill his shoes. Uh, but broker associate also have an MBA in marketing from Case Western right here in Cleveland. And I kind of took all that education and the experience in, in real estate and compiled a class and said, gosh, you know, we I feel we're pretty good at selling our listings and getting listings. And so I uh, compiled this class to kind of share some of those secrets with you. Obviously, I can't get to all of them in an hour because there's a lot of stuff that we do. Hopefully, you're already doing many of these things. And if you are, just pat yourself on the back. Uh, but hopefully everyone here, even experienced agents like Kim and a few of you others that I uh, saw here, uh, Swade's an experienced agent. You know, you guys are hopefully doing many of these things. But if you pick up one or two tips today, I feel like I've accomplished my mission, helping everyone do a better job, especially in light of what's going on in today's market with the commission settlements and that kind of thing. Now, I will mention that stuff a little bit today and how some of the strategies might be a little changed. And I'm not going to dwell on that a whole lot today because we have a lot to get to. Um, by the way, guys, my quick commercial, if you are interested in what we do on our team, there's going to be links everywhere. You can always set up a confidential 15-minute appointment with me. Just click the link to my calendar and set something up. So again, only a one hour class. So let me get rolling on this as quick as I can. I want to talk about how you get CE credit must attend 90% of the class. It's 902 right now. That means you can miss six minutes. Okay. Uh, I will probably not answer many, if any questions during the class. So if you have questions, please hang out after I've got some time after, uh, you don't have to stay for the Q and a, but if you have questions, I will hang out for five, 10, 15 minutes, whatever, and answer those questions in order to get credit for the class. You must click your zoom link. Okay. No dial in only if you're only dialed in, you can't get the video. You you really can't participate in the poll questions and the chat and the Q&A. And, and the state requires a little higher level of accountability from me in order to give you this one hour of credit today for the elective class. So please, when the poll questions pop up, in fact, I'll launch one now. When these polls pop up, please try to Find them. They should pop up on your screen. If not, you can hover your cursor around to find polls. Just look for it. And if you absolutely cannot find the poll question, you can answer in the chat because that's my backup method of tracking your attendance today for the state. Once we have verified everyone's attendance, it takes us two or three days to go through that process. Only about 100 people here today, just under 100. So it should only take me like two days to do it. We'll log you on the state website. We will then send you out certificates that are signed by me with a date in the class blank. You fill in your name and license number and just keep that for your next renewal. No need to send them back and you don't have to ping me, okay? If you get a message from Zoom that says, oh, sorry, you missed the class, don't worry about it. Uh, many times that's just a weird glitch that happens or maybe you um, uh, registered with a different email address than what you log in with. It's probably no big deal. My assistant will email you and say, hey, Leslie, uh, it looks like you didn't attend. And if that is the case, you can always let us know, no, no, I did, and we'll look into it, okay? 99.9% .9 of the time, Zoom tracks everything flawlessly. We're able to look in the chat and the Q&A and the poll questions and verify your attendance. So, and again, no need to chase me down. You will get your certificates in two to three days, and we'll log you on the state website. All right, guys, so let's get down to business here. I have a nice little PowerPoint for you. The poll question, by the way, if you couldn't find it, it looks like uh, 86 of you have answered it. I just want to know how long you're licensed. Uh, we only have a couple people here that are less than a year. A bunch of you, about a third, one to five years. 
uh, 28 percent of you are in the five to 10 year range, 11 percent in the 10 to 20 year range. That's where I am in the 10 to 20 year range. Wow. Time flies. Uh, 10 people, 20 to 30 years. And check this out, guys. In this room right here, we have 10 people who are 30 plus years in the business. Wow, let's give them a little round of applause. Seriously, if you're not doing it, I can't see you. Your cameras are not on, but I'll know if you're not clapping. So please, round of applause for the 30 plus years people. You all doing it? All right, wonderful. All right, so please try to find the poll questions. It's the easiest way for us to verify your attendance. And if you can't, just answer in the chat. All right, so I'm going to end this poll so we can move on, and I'm going to share my screen. Oh, first I'll share these results just real quick so you can see what that looks like. There are several poll questions throughout the day so or throughout the class, so make sure you try to find those. Okay. All right, guys, here's the class you're here for today. This is all my contact info. If you want to follow us so you can find these classes when they come up, the best way is probably Facebook at 21 Mike Team. And if you want to just shoot a quick picture of this, that's one way to grab my contact info. It's also on all our emails, or you can scan this cool QR code. Uh, so guys, if you're not using these yet, there's free electronic business cards out there uh, where you just scan a QR code and then you can save contacts right to your phone. It's really cool. I love this one. It's, it's There's a free version. And of course, there's upgrades. There's Blink. There's Link. There's all kinds of them. Um, if you guys are using any of these electronic cards with the QR codes, drop them in the chat. Share your knowledge today. And by the way, guys, that's one of the big benefits of these online classes, you know, in a normal classroom, you kind of have to sit quietly. You don't want to be the person who asks 10 questions and holds up the class. You can't just interject your comments. Do that today. I highly encourage you stay engaged with me for an hour today. I promise you, even if you're one of those 30 plus year agents, you'll grab one or two or maybe three little tips today that I think you'll love. And if you stay engaged, you'll, you'll definitely take something home with you. All right. So that's my info. The first thing I want to do, this is a listings class, right? So I wanted to brainstorm with you. This is where you participate, guys. So in the chat, just start telling me, what do you think sellers want from you, their listing agent? What do they want from you? Like, what are they looking for? I've got to open my chat here so I can see what you guys are saying. Here we go. Okay, someone said expertise, specifically expertise as to what? Transparency. That's a good one, uh, especially given the lawsuit environment. By the way, guys, it's 908. If you logged in at 907 or after, you won't get credit for today. It's literally that close. If you logged in at 906, you're good. 907, you're not. So it's 908. If you just logged in or you only dialed in, we can't give you credit. You're welcome to hang out for an hour, though, and get our top listing secrets. Great answers here, guys. Guys, I, I think you got all of them. You know, the honesty, transparency, guidance, communication, that's a big one, right? I mean, how many times, especially you experienced agents, have you gone on a listing appointment where they, the sellers were listed previously and you ask them, hey, what went wrong? What do you want to avoid this time? Highest sale price, Fast, highest sale price. Awesome, Victoria. That's a good one. You, gold, that's a gold star for those of you who've never been here. So already gave out one gold star today. I'm running low on those. So hopefully I have enough for the day. But how many times have you sat with a seller? Kim, I bet this has happened to you. And 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 you, that you ask them, hey, what went wrong? What could I do better for you when I list your house this time around? And they say, well, gosh, the last agent just stuck a sign in the yard and I felt like that was it. We heard from them, you know, hardly ever. And it was always, hey, it's time to lower the price, right? So how many of you guys have ever heard that? Hopefully you're not on the receiving end of that. Uh, but communication is one of the biggest things that I hear. How about, how about a marketing, <laughs> how about a marketing plan? Don't they want to know from you? How are you going to market my house? Has anyone ever heard that question on a listing appointment? How are you going to market my house? I mean, if all you're going to do, I would argue, guys, that if all you're going to do is put up a sign and put it in the MLS, 
what are you really doing for your seller clients? So how many of you guys, tell me, tell me yes in the chat if you have a, now listen carefully, a written marketing plan that you share with your sellers. So Regina explains it in the beginning, but do you have a written marketing plan that you share with your sellers? I see some no's and I see a lot of yeses. The yeses, high five, great job. If your answer is no today, guys, I highly encourage you to put together some kind of written marketing plan. I don't care if it's a one pager, okay? Let me take a sip of coffee here. I don't care if it's one page, a step-by-step -step standard operating procedure of what you do. Imagine how powerful that would be. So imagine those of you who said no, there's two agents interviewing for the listing. You come in without a written marketing plan and someone else comes in with one. Who has the advantage right from the start? And guys, I see some people asking to share their marketing plans. Listen, I'm always happy to share that kind of stuff. Um, you can go online and find this stuff. So I'm in the Tom Ferry coaching platform and they have a saying there, R&D everything. Who knows what R&D everything stands for? It's not research and develop. R&D everything stands for what? I know uh, Mike, my teammate Mike is here today. R&D everything. What does he mean? Rip off and duplicate. That's right. Guys, I put videos out there, I incur, and half the videos I get, I just look at other people's videos, especially outside our market. You know, it'd be kind of rude for me to rip off Suede's video, but Atlanta, you know, Las Vegas, Florida, follow agents that have really good content and watch what they're doing and say, you know what, that's a great idea. I'm going to tweak that to suit me. And, and use it. So Vivian had a great comment. You were reading my mind. Guys, ChatGPT is awesome. I do a one-hour ChatGPT class. You could literally go into ChatGPT and say, hey, I'm a real estate agent. Help me put together an outline for a marketing plan to sell houses. And be specific. The more specific you are with AI, the better results. And you could say, give me you know, the basic steps yeah, that's right, Vivian, has the idea for having ChatGPT help you write up a marketing plan. But so guys, you, you've come up with some great ideas. I'm going to put my list on the screen here just for a minute. These are the things I came up with. I'm not saying this is an all-encompassing list, but this is really what they want. And in order to do a great job on your listings, don't you first have to understand what your sellers want from you? So you guys hit, I think, almost all of these maybe. I don't know if anyone mentioned the high quality photos. We're going to talk briefly about that. Um, staging. You know, I one time lost a listing because I didn't mention it. I didn't mention that we offered staging and, oh, well, Mike, we went with someone who offered staging. I literally lost a listing over that. But starting from the top, you know, I'm not going to read through all these guys. Please read this and think about as you are uh, going on listing appointments and speaking with sellers, are you clicking all these boxes? Are you talking about all these? And guys, note number 10, a fair commission. How many of you guys are a little worried about what's going to happen in our industry about commissions? And has anybody, by the way, guys, I have to say this disclaimer. We don't talk about commission amounts we don't uh, talk about trying to keep our commissions high. That's that's not what we do in these get-togethers, these classes, or even our, our weekly training that we do on Tuesdays. That's not what we're here to do, okay? But we want to talk about how to convey the value that we provide. Yeah, I see a lot of you are concerned. But how do we convey the value that we provide? Okay, it's no different than any other service. I like to boil it down to some basic businesses and services. Think about, for a second, restaurants. Why do you pay more to go to Hyde Park, a steakhouse, than you do to go to McDonald's? I mean, the basic of most basic of examples, it's the food quality, right? It's the service. It's the diversity of the dishes, right? So it's the same thing in real estate, there's all these factors that go into why someone would pay us for a service, 
Okay, so to make this focused on listings, when you sit down with a seller and you're talking about why you're valuable, and then they say to you, great, you sound wonderful, but I don't want to offer a commission to buyer's agents. Why should I pay a buyer's agent? I mean, this is a conversation that you're going to have to have. And part of that is, well, listen, let me explain the value that we agents bring to the table. Okay. Again, no talk of amounts or collusion, guys. That's one of the reasons we got in this, in this, uh, in this jam that we're in with these lawsuits. But I have one example I want to share with you today, guys. And this is a little bonus secret. So think about this for a second. I just put a video out on on YouTube. So when you have a seller. Do you guys, first, let me ask you a question. Do you honestly believe, okay, you're the listing agent or if you're the buyer's agent, you know what? You're an agent. Do you honestly believe that offering commissions to co-brokes benefits the seller? Think about that for a second. As a listing agent, if you were selling your property, you own a house, do you believe that offering something to a co-broke, someone said maybe, I'd be curious to have a conversation with you, but offering commission to a co-broke, do you think that benefits you as a seller? And then flip the script, you're a buyer's agent. Do you think you provide anything of value to that seller? You're actually working to sell that seller's property and you may or may not get paid. So do you think that agents provide value and do you think it benefits the seller to potentially offer something to the co-broke. So I just want to get your brains working in that direction for a second. And, and again, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on commissions. So if anyone who said maybe, or if you're not 100% convinced, let me run this past you. For sale by owners. For sale by owners. About 7% of sellers at least try for sale by owner. Now, did you know over 90% of them end up listing with an agent? But how many of you guys have ever encountered a for sale by owner who says, hey, we welcome agents who have qualified buyers and we will pay them? Again, guys, we're not going to talk numbers. How many of you have ever experienced that? A for sale by owner, they're not even on the MLS. And they say, and they say, you know what? Agents are welcome. We will pay you. We'll pay you something. And you might say, well, how much? And you may have to negotiate that. And that's what we're doing now, right, with the new settlement. But why would for sale by owners do that? Candy said it just happened. Why would for sale by owners offer a commission to buyer's agents? It's because they're, kind of, oh, I feel bad for agents. I should pay them. Of course not, right? Of course not. They do it because they know it works. They know that it generates more interest in their properties, more showings, more offers, higher sale price. So guys, that's my proof right there. If I had to pick one argument as to why it benefits sellers. So anyway, but they want a fair commission, right? They want to know that they've had the opportunity to negotiate it. So guys, these are the 12 things you should that I came up with. There's probably more. This is what your sellers want from you. And you guys did a great job. High five. You hit most of them. Now, how do, you know what? Let me go back. I don't want you guys to see that yet. Let's do a poll. Here's a poll. Who loves my polls? I'm just kidding. That's not really the poll. Here it is. All right, here's the poll. What is the number one place buyers find the home that they buy? Now, the reason we're talking about buyers is because when you're a listing agent, don't you have to understand buyer behavior? It's like if you're a fisherman, like my buddy Mike from uh, Apple Valley Lake. Mike's a fisherman. In order to catch fish, Mike, or anyone else, what do you have to understand? You got to understand the fish, right? Where they hang out, what they like to eat, what bait you can use, what time of day is good to catch a certain fish. All right? All right enough fishing analogy, right? But you have to understand buyer behavior in order to do a great job selling your listings. So the number one place that buyers found the home that they bought, this is a 2023 survey. It hasn't changed in decades since the internet came out because the internet is number one. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and click to the next screen here because here's the graph. 
guys, this is how people find the home that they actually bought. And real estate agents, somebody, about a quarter of you guessed real estate agent, that's a close second. Next is the sign, okay? All these things are important. And if you're going to be a great listing agent, you have to know all the places to fish for the fish. Sounds a little redundant, but you have to know where the fish are. And in this case, the fish are the buyers. And you have to tell your seller how you're going to help them find buyers. Okay, guys, looks like 90% of you found the poll question. Please hunt around for that. It makes my job so much easier in confirming your attendance. So if you don't see it, hover your cursor. And if you absolutely can't find it, answer in the chat. Keep chatting it up, guys. You're doing a great job so far. I appreciate you staying with me and engaged. So number one is internet. So what does that mean then? I'm going to end the poll. Good job on the results, guys. Yeah, Karen, I, I've only got an hour today, so I've got to keep it rolling. But guys, this is where they where where people find their homes. And it's sites like Zillow, Realtor.com, your company websites. So understanding where the buyers are is so important in marketing properties. And of course, what do people do when they go to those websites? They plug in criteria, a list comes up, and what's the first thing that they do? They look at the pictures, right? They plug in criteria, and what do you think the first thing is that they do? This, I just pulled this up yesterday. This is a the main photo on a listing in, in Atlanta. How many of you guys, first of all, how many of you guys would love to have a $250,000 listing right now? This is this agent's best effort. And I'm not trying to pick on them, but, you know, come on. Come on. This is their main photo. First thing they do is look at the photos. What I recommend is have a killer main photo. Get your professional photos too, guys. You know, it's there are photographers out there who are hung, hungry for business. $100, $150. What are you guys paying for pro professional photos? Now, obviously, high-end listings, they're going to expect 3D tours and maybe a video tour and a lot, a lot of additional stuff. But what are you guys paying for professional photography on your listing these days? There was a guy, 70 bucks Kim has someone. Wow. 75 to 150, I see. 110. Someone said 4,150. I think she meant 150. <laughs> but guys, it's so worth it, right? That's the first thing. And and for a listing, you know, is this too much to ask? Don't our sellers deserve professional photos? Now, I would take it to the next level and say, how about video? Anybody here using video to market their listings? And are you using it in a way that's really effective? I mean, it's one thing to go on your Facebook page and say, hey, here's a video of a list, my new listing. But how about something that's really powerful, that shows the features of the property and maybe helps out-of-town uh, buyers understand? So back to the photos. Our process is we have a great main photo, and then we put the photos in order, sort of a logical order as though they're walking through the house. Also, guys, if you are going to take your own photos, which way do you hold your phone if you're taking phone photos? Guys, the cameras on these phones are pretty amazing. I think I only have a 12 right now, an iPhone 12. By the way, you Android users, my tip for you, switch to iPhone. I'm just kidding. I'm not here to beat up Android users, but seriously, do them this way. This is a dead giveaway that you took your own photos when we're looking at your listings. Yeah. Hold your phones this way at least. And by the way, guys, the iPhones have a nice wide angle feature. So in those in those narrow rooms like half baths and so forth, and Nicole says Android forever. All right. I'll give you that, Nicole. By the way, guys, um, how many of you include things like pictures of the mechanicals, the electric panel, the furnace? In the MLS now, I've seen listings with like 45 photos. So especially on investment properties, what do those investors want to see? How's the basement look? You know, is there uh, an upgraded panel? Now, I'm not saying, and Stephanie, that's a great answer. She says, yes, it depends. Um, because look, it, you don't necessarily want to have photos of every furnace and every water tank, but can you see why it might be valuable? you know, especially toward the end of the photos, okay? You don't want to have it as the third photo, but especially with investment properties, we take a close-up of the roof, you know, because 
how many times is your investor buyer looking at it going, mm, I wonder how the roof is. So we always try to include angles of all sides of the property, backyard, if there's a garage, if there's extra storage, a deck, how about a pond or a pool, you know, all those features and not just wide angle photos. How about close-ups? So one of the things that comes to mind that I always love to have close-ups of, how about the glass doorknobs in the old houses? Isn't it kind of cool to have some close-ups too, to mix things up? Sorry, guys, just checking my notes, make sure I didn't miss anything. Ah, someone's mentioning drone photos. I love that. Okay, so that we'll look at that bad photo long enough. All right, so let's get into some other marketing stuff now. All right, we're right, I'm a marketing guy, MBA from Case Western, concentration in marketing. And I have a little saying I love to use, and it's all about the three Ps. And we have something that I call the old three Ps of marketing a listing. And what what's the old strategy? You know, you put it in the MLS, you place a sign, and then agents pray for the phone to ring. So guys, if this is what your plan is, if this is your marketing plan, I would argue we need to up our game, right? So I have something I like to talk about called the new three Ps, because this is really part of what our sellers are expecting from us. And it's actually four Ps now. So what do sellers want from us? What's a question? Don't they, how many of you guys raise your hands? I know I can't see you, but pretend like I can see you. Raise your hands if a seller has ever said to you, Faith, what things should I do to get top dollar and make my house sell faster. I don't want to spend a thousand dollars to get back 500 though, right? Isn't that part of the service that we offer? And I know you guys may push back on this a little bit, but how about offering resources to help get those things done? I mean, I get it. Some, some agents push back and say, look, I don't want the liability. If I recommend a handyman and he breaks something or the people say, Oh, my, my, uh, uh, silver certificates that were tucked in a drawer were stolen while that handyman was here. I get it. We're sticking our necks out a little bit by making recommendations, but isn't that one of the services that we can potentially offer to set ourselves apart and do a great job? Yeah. And, and sellers may or may not know contractors. You know, Marcy, that's a great point. Sometimes they don't know people. We're in the business every day. And Karen, like she's saying, but Karen, change your chat to everyone. She has a list of contractors. Pamela says she always gives three names. I love that. Now it's their choice. Our team disclosure says right on there, look, we may make recommendations. We've had success with them in the past, but we don't uh, share any liability for using them. You're welcome to do your own due, due diligence. Now, will that stand up if they decide to sue me because the contractor I recommended uh, broke something or they say stole something? I don't know. But part of the service that we offer. So preparing the house. Now, some people may say, look, I don't want to do anything. I just want to sell it as is. But isn't it our duty to at least let them know, hey, if you want to do some preparations, you know, I've been in some of Kim's uh, listings and they always are well prepared. You know, people are always well prepared when they work with a professional like, like her. Now, some people might say, I don't want to lift a finger, Mike, or who, you know, if it's your listing, don't force them but at least offer that as an option. Now, the second thing in the new four Ps is proper promotion of the property. Say that 10 times fast. That's the marketing plan, guys. They wanna know that you're gonna do more than just put it in the MLS and it goes to Zillow and a few other websites, right? So what else? I would, I would ask you all to think about this question, all right? Pretend I'm a seller and I'm speaking to each and every one of you. And I say, great, Cheryl, what else do you do to sell my property besides what happens automatically through the MLS and your company? Tell me three things that you do on top of that. Because anybody, ah, Marcy, good answer. Marcy, change your chat to everyone. I want them to see your answers. Gennard uh, got it too, open house. I'm going to give you guys a list of some other things that you can do 
radio ads, that's different. Now I would argue, go back to that, this graphic here. Let me see if I can get back to it. Go back to this graphic and think about the things that are most important. Now I'm not, hey, anything, if you're really doing radio, that's cool, that's different. But what else are you going to do? Be able, look at these answers, guys. I hope you're watching the chat. Uh, Amy says, postcards, canvas the neighborhood, open house. Guys, that's one of the things we believe in, having an open house and door knock the neighborhood. Anybody doing that? Is, is, is anybody knocking on doors? Social media, I see Facebook. Guys, do you know how easy it is to run a Facebook ad right now? I do a video on this on my YouTube channel. It's a little short training, a 20-minute training about how to run a Facebook ad. For example, for an open house. Did you know you can target a radius, a 15 mile radius around your open house and target people who've recently visited Zillow? It's so easy, realtor.com. So Suede says he's not a big believer in door knocking. I'm gonna share, you, share a quick story with you guys. I still have the sign-in sheet from an open house that I did with a teammate. We door knocked to the neighborhood. Suede, I'm gonna change your mind or at least make you think about it. This just happened a month ago. Okay. A month ago, I did an open house with a teammate and we door knocked. I must've knocked on about 40 doors and my teammate knocked on a handful, but I knocked on 40 or 50 doors. One of the neighbors said, thanks for inviting me. I'm not looking, but I know some people who are some friends from work, some friends. This guy brought three buyers. He got on the phone I had no idea he was going to do this. I thought, yeah, 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 whatever. He knows some buyers. He called three buyers. All three of them showed up to my open house. I got their names, phone numbers, and email addresses. I got three additional leads from my open house because I invited that neighbor. Now, I jokingly said, hey, how much do I owe you? You know, And we had a little fun. The, the, his friends were all there at the same time, all because I invited the neighbor to, to the open house. So guys, I'm not saying do things you're uncomfortable with doing. I don't want to get shot, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, I guess I'm just saying, if you don't do one thing, what else are you doing? So be prepared to answer that question. The seller says to you, hey, I know this; these things happen automatically. Tell me what else you do to promote my listing. Number three. Price it correctly. Guys, I have a, a survey or a poll question coming up on pricing, but are we doing anyone a favor by overpricing? I mean, right now, underpricing doesn't hurt because you're getting multiple offers, but pricing it correctly. And coming up, I have a poll question that's really going to make you think about the numbers you choose when you price, okay? Now, number four, this is the one that that I add on the, the, the new four Ps is don't we really owe it to our sellers to actually look for buyers? I mean, isn't that our job? You know, so I saw a lot of great examples, postcards. I saw ads, social media. That's prospecting for, for buyers. So I would argue, guys, that part of our job as a listing agent is that we should be actively prospecting. All right. Anybody, come? any additional uh Comments, questions, Kim mentions re reverse prospecting in the MLS. If you guys don't know what that is, look it up. It's a real simple feature to, to use. All right. Next, I want to talk about communication. That was something that came up as a list, you know, and you guys talked a lot about communication. So when you take a listing, this is a Brian Buffini thing. Any, anybody here fans of Brian Buffini? He talks about how when you first get a listing, everybody's happy. He calls it he calls it the cup of love, and the cup is full. Everyone's everyone's oh great, we're gonna sell this property, and I love you, uh, Muhammad. You're gonna be a great agent, and you know we're gonna do a great job selling this house. But as time goes on, or if offers come in too low, or no offers come in, or you're not getting enough showings, that cup of love starts to diminish. One great way that we can keep it fuller is with regular communication. So how many of you guys set an expectation up front for when you communicate, when you update your sellers? I got this straight from Buffini. I pick a day. So I say, hey, here's the plan. By the way, 
every Friday morning, you will get an update from me. Weekly calls, Victoria does it, Zach does it once a week. And do you guys tell them what day and time? I think it's really important to tell them what day and time. Otherwise, Elijah, what happens? She's got, someone said touch in Tuesdays. Who was that? Dolores, D. What does it do? What's the value of saying it's going to happen at this day and time? What does that prevent? Why is that valuable to pick a certain day and time? Sets the expectation. But what does it prevent? It forms a habit. And it also keeps them from saying, hey, what's going on? You know, if they don't know that you're going to update them on Friday, what happens? Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, they're like, hey, hey, Darlene, what's going on? Uh, we, we we had a showing yesterday. What what happened? Now, Christine makes a good point. We need updates more regularly, perhaps. So maybe you do twice a week. Also, Debbie, great point. It shows you're a re reliable. It builds trust. It shows you have a plan. Okay. Now, what I usually tell people is I do a thorough weekly update on Friday mornings. But obviously, if something exciting happens before that, you will hear from me. So maybe there was a showing and they asked questions. They, they ask, hey, I'm going to reach out to you and say, hey, there was a really good showing. They want to know these three things. Of course, you're going to hear from me before Friday for that. But guys, if your clients are reaching out to you saying, Candy, what's going on? What happened with this? Or, or, or what are we going to do next week? If they're reaching out to you, what do they assume you're doing? If your clients are saying, hey, Akram, What's happening? Did we have, you know, what, are we having an open? They assume you're doing nothing. They assume you're doing nothing if they reach out to you. So Debbie, I would argue that your clients don't think that. If they're not hearing from you, Debbie says working behind the scenes. She says they assume you're working behind the scenes. I would argue that they don't think that. That if they're reaching out to you for updates, they're thinking, oh, Debbie's probably on the golf course or on her boat. Yeah, if they hear from you. Great, Debbie. Thank you. If they hear from you, they assume that you're doing everything that you said. So in my updates, I always tell people what we did this week, what those results were, what the feedback was on those results, and then what we plan on doing next week. Okay, and here's the plan for next week. The other thing this does, guys, is how many of you struggle with getting price reductions? I know it's not as prevalent now because it seems like you could put up any listing, even with that bad picture we looked at earlier, and it just sells. But uh, how many of you struggle with price reductions? And why is that? You, you have a listing, and 30 days in, you say, hey, maybe it's time to reduce the price. My first question as a seller is, well, geez, what else did we do? Did you do anything else before we just jumped to assuming that the price is the problem? But if you've done weekly updates and told them everything that you've done, not giving it away. Kathy, I love that. I mean, how many times I'm not giving my house away. Anybody ever heard that one? But if you've done the weekly updates and you've told them, look, I've done this, this, and this, we've got a lot of showings, and here was the feedback. It makes it easier when you do eventually ask them to adjust the price. Okay. And don't just dive into it. I would say, I would say, look, here's all the things I did. Here's what I'm going to do next week. If this doesn't work and we don't start getting interest or offers, maybe it's time to start thinking about a price reduction. And then next week, it's remember how we were thinking about it. Here's what happened. Here's what I did. It's time. And maybe it's time for another open house. So guys, I do want to talk about open houses real quick, because remember, on that chart, the third most powerful way people found listings was the sign. So I want to see numbers in the chat right now. Tell me numbers in the chat. When you do an open house, how many signs do you put up? Six, three, minimum of four, six. Someone said as many as we can. I saw an eight to ten. Suede says eight. That's pretty good. So guys, in my office, in my little closet that we call an office, we have about a hundred open house signs. Now that's because on any given weekend, I might have three, four open houses going, but guys, we're putting up a minimum of 10 and sometimes 20 to 30. The directional arrows, 
Vicky says eight to 10, not bad. But guys, why not? If you're going to spend that time and you're going to do all that marketing, why wouldn't you put up as many signs as you can, especially on the main streets? And also, door knock, balloons. I know I'm never going to convince Wade to door knock, but, uh, <laughs> but at least I saw Wade mention social media ads. Yeah. So guys, really maximize your open houses. Uh, Tom Ferry does something, uh, coaching that he calls mega open house. All those things that you can do to maximize your open house. Guys, the last open house I did that I was telling you about, I had 15 sign-ins. Okay, good, not great. But I also got every single contact info for every single person who came in because I work the door and nobody gets in my open house without giving me contact info. And this particular time, not one of them was Mickey Mouse. So guys, look up Mega Open House and, and watch some Tom Ferry videos on, on that. Now, I want to talk about price just for a quick second here. Oh, actually, yeah, let's talk price. I'm going to launch another poll. Um, oh. All right, guys, here's the poll. You have a potential listing that's worth around 200000 What's the best list price for that listing, for that property? It's worth around 200000 My choices that I'm giving you, you have to pick one. It's the best. one ninety eight, eight eighty eight, one ninety nine nine, two hundred thousand 299 even, or 210000 Now, I'm going to talk you through what the rationales are for each one. 198,888, that's a different number. It stands out. I've heard that argument. 199,9, it's kind of like the grocery store in their minds, in the minds of buyers. It's not quite 200,000. It seems better, right? How about 200,000? Why on earth would that be good? Or 210? We think it's worth around 200, so we go 210 to give us some wiggle room. No one's ever heard that, right? Anyone ever hear, hey, I want to have wiggle room. I want to have wiggle room. It's right up there for me. That's right up there with, I don't want to give my house away. Wiggle room. Okay, so guys, right now, almost half of you are saying 199.9. What if I told you that's wrong? And my criteria for wrong is, what's our job? Our job is to get more eyes on the property. What if I told you that 199.9 actually gets you fewer views online? I see a bunch of you in the chat. You're all very smart who are saying this in the chat. But you actually get fewer views online. And I'm going to show you why the 210 is potentially wrong, too. All right. Now, guys, these are my opinions I'm sharing today. If you continue to do things a certain way, look, I, I, I'm not saying that uh, I know everything, but this is just my experience and some thoughts I'm sharing today. So what I pulled up here is your typical Zillow search. Now, again, I understand not everybody is using Zillow, but you have to understand that most of the websites function like this. Even you as agents, when you set up a search for someone in the multiple listing service, what are you doing? You're plugging in criteria. Someone tells you, hey, I'm pre-approved for 250. So you might do a 200 to 300 search. And why do you put the 200 in? Guys, why are you putting minimum numbers on your searches? Maybe they don't want a property that needs a ton of work. Maybe they're looking for something that's nicer, and they know that in that area, the $100,000 houses aren't going to meet their criteria. Look, we're approved for $250. Give me $200 to $300. Now, back to price. Knowing that buyers behave this way, what did we say earlier? If we're going to fish, we have to know where the fish are and how they behave. Knowing that buyers do exactly this, and guys, I didn't have to do anything here. Zillow automatically did this. Oh, okay, cool. $200 to $300. If I price at 199.9, am I getting this buyer? 198, 888. Guys, just because the number looks different, does this buyer see that? And like many of you said, you very smart students today, if I price at 200, I get both the 200 and under buyer 
and the 200 to 300 or 200 to 400. Pricing in round numbers, there's data on this. You actually get more hits online. And that's why, that's one of the things that your sellers want from you. More hits online, they want more showings, they want more offers, and they want a higher sale price in a faster time. Now, those of you who said, how about 210? If I adjusted the search from 100 to 200, or if I priced at 310, do you see what happens? 310 doesn't fall in the search. In order to have that wiggle room, you might be missing 30% of the hits that you could potentially get on one website like Zillow and on the MLS searches, et cetera, et cetera. And guys, it's the same thing for all these other fields. Now, you know, this is a very dumbed down version of a search, okay? But when you have people plugging in four bedrooms or more, square footage, these are all criteria that can limit your search results. So as the listing agent, it's your duty to plug in all the data in the MLS in a way that gets your client more hits. All right, so hopefully you guys all answered that poll question. Let me check and see how you're doing. 94% of you. Uh, answer the poll question. Great job. I'm going to end this poll. I'm going to share the results. Literally half of the people in the class today said 199.9 is the way to go. I don't know if I've changed your mind. Swade, which way were you going? Which way did you answer? But anyway, guys, these are my arguments for why pricing in round numbers makes more sense. I mean, and if you're a buyer's agent, now knowing that this is the way agents are thinking, aren't you going to set your searches up a little differently, maybe search 195 to 310 so that you're capturing those extra those extra listings for your buyers to look at. That's a different class though. I do a buyer secrets class and this is one of the things I talk about. And I'm going to reference this. I'm going to say the last listing class I did, 50% of agents answered that they would price at 199.9. Knowing that, how do you set up your buyer search? So guys, I'm going to show you one more thing here regarding the criteria that we plug in. The criteria that we plug in in our listings is so important. So this is a Parma schools search that I did yesterday. Okay, Parma, if you're not from Cleveland, it's just a suburb. I did Parma schools. Now, what's interesting here is as you look at the results doing a school district search, look at what comes up. I've got Parma Heights. Oops, I've got Parma. Look at these that say Cleveland, though. There's three of them right there that all say Cleveland. Why is that? Four of them that say Cleveland. Do you guys know why that is? I know you can't talk. You can only type, and it's too, too long of an answer. It's partially zip code. It's partially overlapping, but it's not really, okay? What happens is if you pull these up on the county website... It'll say, and I'm sorry if this is anyone's listing that's here today, very low odds of that, but 29, 29, 21, 29 Grovewood. In the county records, it says Cleveland, Ohio. So, you know, if I sent a letter to this address, Cleveland, Ohio, 44134, that's right, Jacqueline got it. That letter would get there because it's Cleveland, but the zip code will get the letter there. My teammate Mike is a postmaster. He knows this too. But guys, here's what happens. What are most agents doing when they're searching by they're searching by city, right? How many of you guys are searching by school district? So Suede says city specific. Exactly. So when I go in and search for Parma, these four listings that say Cleveland, will they come up? can search by zip code. Yes, that's another way to do it. Guys, you guys are hitting this today. So you have to be conscious as a listing agent that some people are going to search by zip code. So Pamela says always by di school district for us, but the converse is also true. Okay. What if I'm searching by city? What was I going to say? Searching by school district isn't always right either. Okay. So what if like there's a part of Shaker, I'm sorry, a part of Cleveland that goes to Shaker schools. 
if I search by school district, I might miss some Cleveland listings. What if I have an investor that's looking in Cleveland in a certain price range by searching by school district? So guys, the point of my story here, it's twofold. When you're setting up buyer searches, make sure you set up searches in a bunch of different ways so you're capturing all the listings. And when you're the listing agent, fill this stuff out correctly. Make sure it doesn't default to Cleveland when it's actually Parma. Guys, what about these blanks here? Do you guys see these blanks under square foot? Do you know why there's nothing here? It's because the agent didn't fill in the square footage. So what do you think these come up in a search? How many square feet do you think these come up? Yeah, Victoria, area search is gone. Someone said zero. You guys got it. So what if you have a buyer searching for Parma, a thousand square feet or more, three bedrooms or more, does this house on Wilbur come up? No, unless they check the little, who said no bueno? Suede, of course. Gold star suede. Fine, you got one. Suede's been gunning for a gold star the whole class. He finally got one. Anyway, guys, unless they are checking the zero square foot box in the MLS, this listing doesn't come up. And as a listing agent, for shame. Now on Zillow, you guys saw there was no way to check a box that said zero square foot. So if I'm a buyer who uses the additional criteria, this listing does not come up. Partially because it says Cleveland, partially because there's no square foot. One more quick thing here, guys. Let's say you have a listing that's 0.19 acres. Uh, Pamela, I'm going to address your comment here in a second, but say it says 0.19 acres. Would it be wrong to round that to 0.2? What if you have people searching for 0.2 acres or more and you've got 0.19? Do you think that buyer, do you think that buyers, the fish out there, might want to see that listing, even though it's 0.19, not quite 0.2. So guys, also take a look at rounding. Rounding your criteria when applicable without being dishonest or misleading to the public. If it's 0.16, am I rounding that to 0.2? I don't know. Same thing with 1.01 acres. Can you see a reason why you might round that down to one even? What if it's 1.02 acres? Do you understand why it might be beneficial? Dan, I know you're out in the Lake and Geauga County where there's bigger lots. What if I have a buyer who says, look, I don't want a lot of land. It has to be an acre or less. If you have 1.02, can you see why it might benefit you to say one acre in the stats? Because now I'm getting the one acre and under, and I'm also still getting the one acre and up. Yeah, don't, well, room measurements, that's a different thing. What was the comment? You know what? I'll come back to that. I got to keep rolling here. So guys, what you type in on your input sheets and when you do your data entry, it's so important. It's so important. I know it's kind of nerd stuff and I love geeking out on nerd stuff. Here's the map search, guys. How many of you have ever pulled up a listing and the little dot was in the middle of Lake Erie or this was a Parma house and the dot is in North Ridgeville? Did you guys know you can manually move the pin? You can move that pin. This is frustrating for me because I'm looking for vacant land right now to build some houses. So I see vacant lot on Main Street. And yet the pin is right in the middle of the road because there's no address. Guys, in the MLS, you can manually go in and move the pin and put it where it's supposed to be. So if you have a vacant lot, for example, and it just ends up in the middle of the road, Move that pin. And it's so important, guys. Ask your fellow agents here how frustrating it is when you say, oh, I want to see this property and you pull up the map link and it's in the wrong place. Now I got to try to sort out from, you know, going in the county data, uh, pulling up that little tiny map and figuring out where it is. Move your pins, guys. That's another tip. I think we're up to like seven. You guys had five, I said, and we already got seven. Um, all right. Let's see here. All right, we're doing good. I'm going to launch the last poll. And then I'm going to answer questions. Share the results on that. Okay, here's my last poll. To receive your certificate from today's class, 
Here are your choices. You should call, text, and email me daily until you get it. And I see someone already picked that. I'm going to guess Suede. Or you just need to wait two to three days to receive it by email. Or choice three is, I'm not sure I wasn't paying attention. Two funny people in the class. But seriously, guys, I just wanted to do a little poll again to verify your attendance at the end of the class here. And also to remind you, don't sweat it. Give me two days, maybe three. They, they will come by email. You fill in your name and license number and keep it. You don't have to send it back to me. Okay, so I'm going to keep that poll open, guys, and I'm going to go ahead to the next screen here. Here's my contact info again. If you want to scan this QR code, I'm going to go to the Q&A real quick. Guys, it's like uh, four minutes till 10. So I finished a little early. I'm going to hit up the Q&A. If you were here on time, if you have to run somewhere, you've got your 90%. Otherwise, please stay till 10 o'clock. You've got four more minutes, and I'm going to answer any Q&A here. Ah, looks like there weren't any questions. So let me go back up. Someone had a comment that I wanted to address. Ah, thank you, Kim. See, even an experienced, awesome agent like Kim said she got something new today. Uh, where was that one comment? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Suede. I shouldn't have accused you wrong wrongfully. Um, someone asked vacant lots where I'm looking everywhere. Okay. Uh, definitely we're looking for cheaper stuff because we're looking to build little homes like, like 12, uh, 14 to 1600 square foot homes priced in the 200. So right now, like 25 grand and under pretty much anywhere except Cleveland outside of Cleveland. It has to be, uh, let's see. Yeah. Someone commented on don't round room dimensions. Okay, so Pamela, Pamela made this comment here about the MLS automatically putting data in from a tax record. Guys, this is exactly what you have to watch out for. The MLS pulling from the county records a lot of times will pull the city incorrectly. So even if it's Parma or Lyndhurst or Mayfield or you know all your other cities, it may automatically pull in Akron when it's actually Bath. Okay, so you've got to make sure to double check your listings when the data gets pulled in automatically, okay? And also square footage. How many, you guys in the Heights area or areas where there's big homes with finished third floors, how many times have you seen 1,850 square feet, but you know the first floor is 925, the second floor is 925, but there's a finished third floor. I'll use simpler numbers, 1,600 square feet. First floor is 800, second floor is 800 but there's a finished third floor. Is 1,600 square feet right? Guys, the finished third floor often is not included in county records. Let's see what else here. Ah, the polygon tool. The map search is amazing. So guys, for every single search, if I draw on the map, but the pin is in the wrong place, I missed that listing. That's why it's so important as listing agents that we're getting this stuff right. So, all right, guys, any other questions? Otherwise, we'll wrap it up. Please uh, look for my email. And if you want to chat real estate with me, hit me up anytime. I always have a little calendar link. Uh, you can schedule a confidential 15-minute appointment with me. So Darlene says, probably because they didn't pull a permit to finish the third floor. Not always. Not always. Just when it was initially put um, in the county they only counted the first and second floor for whatever reason. Maybe back in the 1920s or 1940s when the house was built, it just never got recorded. So important to check all these data fields, guys. Yeah, Sherry, the whole POS compliant, yes or no, that would be a good field to have. That's mainly a Cleveland thing. I bet outside of our greater Cleveland area, you guys don't even know what a point of sale inspection is, right? Yeah, Nick, those two questions. Oh, here we go. A couple questions in the q and I'll, I'll hang out, guys, and answer these. But if you have to run, it's now 10 o'clock. Thank you so much for being here. DocuSign class coming up in the month. And I'll be doing my chat GPT class, my one-hour elective coming up to uh, core law. will be here before June if you need that. Uh, anyway, here's two questions. 
Uh, how do you successfully get contact info at an open house? Kathy, this is such a great question. So what most agents do at open houses is they have a sign-in sheet on the table or on the counter, right? Hey, if you don't mind signing in, what are some people going to do? They're going to put fake names. They may say, no, thank you, and keep on walking. They may just write their name and not put phone number or email address. So guys, here's what I do. I don't leave it up to the client. I'll take my little clipboard or pieces of paper or whatever. And Kathy, when you walk in my open house, I greet you, of course. Hi, you're here for the open house today. Great. Um, I just need to log you in. What is your name? And notice I'm showing you my bald spot, but also putting my head down. It's really hard for you to say, oh, no, thank you. Or I say, great. What is your name? And what's the best email for you? And if they say, well, I don't want you getting, don't want you emailing. Well, great. Then how about a phone number? If they won't give me either, I'll usually push back. I, look, I don't want to interrogate people, but I have several objection handlers that we use. Like, hey, I promised the seller I'd keep track of who came in their home today. That's a good one. During COVID, this was easy because look, I, I'm required to keep track of who was here today just in case. You know, we're all masked up and using hand sanitizer. But in case I need to get in touch with you or in case you have any questions, guys, I will get phone and or email from everyone who steps to the door of my open house. You just have to have it in your head that you will do this also. Don't be passive about it. Don't leave the sign-in sheet there. Um, I hate to say this. I, I, I This agent surely won't remember me, but several years ago, we were looking for a house and I walked into an open house with my wife and I said, hey, I want to do an experiment. The agent was way in the kitchen and we came in the front door and she was like, oh, you know, how you doing? Hey, welcome to the open house. You know, sign in sheet here in the kitchen, something. And we just walked around and then not another word from the agent. And then we finished, we 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 walked out. She's like, oh, you know, sign in sheet here, here in the kitchen. And we just walked and I, and I heard her say something kind of rude, you know, and I didn't call her, oh, okay, well, just ignore me, you know, whatever. But the point is stand at the front door, greet people with a big smile have that sign-in sheet ready and, and you'll have a lot more success getting your contact info at, at an open house. Uh, Latricia asked, do I pay for pictures or staging for sellers? So it depends. I'll tell you what we do. We do pay for photos. Um, there's a photographer and guys, I'll find his card if you're interested. There's a photographer who just did some video for us who actually lets you pay when the listing sells. Now, when the market shifts, which it surely will, I wonder if he'll keep that same policy because right now 99% of listings are selling, I would say. Uh, but yes, we pay for professional photos. Staging, we don't. Now, if we had a really luxury listing, maybe I would, maybe I would. The problem is that, you know, with the lack of loyalty we get from clients, do you really wanna put thousands out of pocket? And, and, you know, the answer is maybe, you know, especially if you're in a luxury price range, that might be expected. Anybody watch Million Dollar Listing? I don't, but my wife does. So by default, I do. Yeah, guys, if you if you got to run, if you have to run, please take off. I'm going to hang out for a couple minutes and answer any uh, remaining questions. But hit me up anytime. Uh, my email is mike at 21mike.com or reply to any of those emails you got from me. Um, but back to the staging. So Million Dollar Listing. In LA, for example, they're paying for these open house events tens of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, and there's no guarantee the listing is going to sell, but that's what's expected in that market. So here in Northeast Ohio, at least, our price range is pretty low. I mean, unless you're in the luxury area, areas, Gates Mills, Hunting Valley, you know, I think it depends on your market as to what you're expected to pay for. So again, we're here talking about competing for listings, impressing your sellers. So if you're competing for a luxury listing and there's three other agents, all of whom offer to pay for photos and pay for staging, and you don't, that may make you look less qualified for that listing. So answer is it depends like it is for so many things in real estate, right? Okay, Jacqueline. Open houses, no longer actively selling, just a referral basis. But when I was working, open houses were generally considered to be ineffective. Uh, you'd end up with nosy neighbors, casual, not serious buyers, but it was a great way to get buyer clients. Is this still the case or do open houses uh, actually work? 
I think that's the gist of Jacqueline's question. So guys, I also had unsuccessful open houses, especially back in the day when it was a buyer's market and there were so many listings out there. Imagine that. I guess I would argue that I was doing them wrong back then, that there's a right way to do open houses. And especially now, our open houses are really well attended, really, really well attended. Um, but it's all in how you prepare for them. Okay, so it's it's like anything else. If you're going to bake a cake, have a recipe, right? Have a plan. If you don't, if you just wing it, you're going to get the ratios wrong. So I, I would say, guys, that right now, especially with the changes happening in buyer's agency, open houses are going to be amazing for the next year. Okay, right now they're really good. Like I said, the last open I did, uh, 15 sign-ins. It was awesome. Um, let's see. There's a question. New buyer's contract. Yeah, so guys, uh, someone's asking about the, the the buyer's agency agreement. I'm doing a ton of training on that. I'm probably not going to do a CE, but if you follow us on Facebook or look at our YouTube channel, I'm putting content out nonstop about the buyer's agency agreement. Um, don't you think you'll have buyer agent represented buyers coming through your open? 100%. Guys, so if uh, uh, the 15 sign-ins I got, I think three or four of them said, I have an agent. Right. I want to know that up front. Guys, do you want to waste your time chasing a client who already has an agent and maybe already has a buyer's agency agreement signed with them? That's the whole point of the sign-in sheet. It's to figure out who is a potential and who isn't a potential client for us. The other thing, Jacqueline, regarding open houses, what if I told you that you're missing the boat if you don't think of your open houses not only as a potential way to get buyers, but also to get sellers. That <laughs> candy, you're funny. Uh, seller leads from open houses, guys. Uh, there's, I don't know if she's here today, but long time ago, um, I looked to experienced agents to mentor me. And there's a Debbie. She's a West Side agent here in the Cleveland area, and she told me that. She said, Mike. I asked her. I said, how? What's, how are you getting your business? And she said, open houses. I'm like, yeah, but you get a lot of listings. And she said, exactly. Who comes to open houses? Yes, it's buyers. But first of all, don't those buyers sometimes have a home to sell? And who else comes to open houses? Jacqueline, you said it, the nosy neighbors. Isn't it true that some of those nosy neighbors are there because they're thinking of selling? We just had this happen. So uh, Swade, <laughs> another open house. He might be gone already, but a teammate of mine did an open house, door knocked the neighborhood. A couple came in, very standoffish. He got their contact info, but he got to chatting with them. And they said, look, we're not looking to buy right now. And he said, oh, you know, then, you know, what brings you here today? Well, we're going to be selling soon. And this house is very near ours, roughly the same size as ours. And we're curious to see what homes are selling for. From that conversation, he got a listing appointment. So guys, if you're not thinking of your open houses as opportunities to get listing appointments, you're missing the boat. You're missing a third of the business that you could get from your open houses. Because I would argue that a third of your leads could be sellers or buyers, both, and, are just, and the two thirds are just buyers. And sure, 10, 20% of them are already going to have agents, but does that mean you throw away the rest of them just because some of them are already represented? Okay. Yeah, I get it, Sweet. I'm I'm just, you know, I, I, I people who participate in my class, the it's a blessing and a curse because if you participate, I see that you are and I get engaged with you. So uh listen, there's I always tell my teammates, do you want more business? And if the answer is yes, I say, great, what are you going to do? And if they say, well, I don't know, I start throwing out options. And one option is to cold call. If you're a Mike Ferry fan, he's going to tell you, look, I guarantee you'll get business if you cold call. That's not for me. I don't love door knocking either, but I do it because I know it works and I'm a lot more comfortable in person. Uh, Mike, my teammate from down in uh, Howard uh, near Mount, Mount Vernon, he's an in-person guy too. He's a lot more effective in person. So when he's cold calling, he's just trying to get face-to-face -face with somebody. So 
I'm not here to tell you, you must do these certain things in order to be successful. There's no one way to be successful in this business. There's lots of ways. But if you're an agent, especially if you're my teammate, I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to say, you said you wanted more business. What will you do? What are you willing to do? Are you going to send out mailers? Are you going to do video? Are you going to be active on social media? Are you going to call your sphere? Um, yes, Wade, contact Jed. He's he's in touch with that seller. Um, don't ask me. I, I, I don't know. But those, um, yeah, I think one of them just went under contract. So there might be six left. But guys, back to my point. What are you willing to do? If you're going to do the same thing, if you're going to wait for your phone to ring, then you're going to have the same results you had last year, or maybe even less results because the market's tightening up, right? There are fewer total transactions. So what are you willing to do? But today's, hopefully you guys enjoyed this today. I feel like these uh, examples I gave you of how to do a better job on your listings, these are pretty universal. Um, some people might push back on certain items, but uh, I think that these are pretty universal. They've worked for us. Like I said, we, we hover between 50 and 100 listings. And uh, if you want to chat more, hit me up on my calendar link, guys, or email me, mike at 21mike.com. I'm going to wrap up, guys. Thank you so much for being here. I hope to see you on future classes. And by the way, there will be a review link in my email. Uh, if you love the class, go ahead and fill it out. Do a Google re review for me. If you hated it, no need. Thanks, guys.